Major Lindsay and Africa presents Bouncing Back, conversations about resilience for lawyers. Welcome to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. This podcast is brought to you by Major, Lindsay, and Africa, the global leader in legal search and consulting. I'm your host, Rebecca Glatzer. I'm a managing director in the associate practice group at Major, Lindsay, and Africa. In this podcast, I'll speak to successful professionals about the hiccups, bumps, bruises, and setbacks they've experienced in their careers and personal lives, and how they ultimately bounce back from those experiences that thrive. Today, my guest is Craig Stowe. Craig is Senior Counsel, Intellectual Property and Data Protection at Phillips 66 Company. Craig is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and Baylor University School of Law. Craig has been practicing in the area of intellectual property for more than 19 years. His practice focuses on all aspects of brand protection and other IP-related areas, including licensing, copyrights, enforcement, digital media, software development, information technology, cybersecurity, and data protection. Craig currently serves as treasurer of the IP section for the State Bar of Texas. He has been recognized as a leading in-house brand counsel by World Trademark Review and as a global leader for being one of the most influential individuals in the area of trademarks. In 2021, Craig was awarded the Fritz Lanham Annual Trademark Award by the IP section of the State Bar for significant contributions in trademark law. Phillips 66 was named North America Team of the Year by WTR in 2015 and 2022. Craig also serves on the board of directors for the Herman Park Conservancy, responsible for one of the oldest and largest parks in the greater Houston area, where he co-chairs the Corporate Engagement Committee. He was formerly in private practice in the Houston office of King and Spaulding, where he was the chair of the Associates Committee and a member of the Hiring Committee. Craig, thank you for being with me today. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Well, I want to get right into it. Uh, Craig, we've talked previously, and you made the leap from law firm associate to in-house counsel fairly quickly in your career. I I think you told me it was about eight years that you had under your belt before you made that leap, which in my experience is a pretty quick uh, transition. Um, Some some attorneys, it takes them decades to make this leap. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about how you got to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that I actually had no intention of going in-house at the time that this discussion really kicked off. And uh, who it was that inspired it was actually a client who had been visiting for a couple of days at our office. We were doing some brainstorming and strategy seminars. And uh, at dinner one night, he leans over and said, you should really think about you know coming in-house. And I was like, wow, I've never really thought about that before. Um, but the longer I, I kept working with him because he was a little bit more senior than me, I thought he would really be an awesome person to to learn under, to, to have a mentor. And um, I just liked what his path looked like. And I also thought about it in the sense that even if I was going to move from private practice to in-house, that didn't have to be a forever career move. And it might be advantageous for me to see what it is like from the client's perspective. Um, So I I just saw the practical benefits and the potential training ground um, and opportunity that working for a large company um, presented. And and I would say, you you know, um, I'm certainly happy uh, where I am. I'm, I'm always surprised about how much more I'm doing and you know, one of the things, uh, looking back, um, you don't always realize this, but as an associate, of, especially at a large firm where you're assigned to a specific practice group and a specific partner, um, you're pretty you're pretty specialized. Um, you're dedicated to to a client. You have a very narrow er- er- area of focus for the most part. <clears throat> and although you know, you hear about branching out and working with other partners and, and I can get into a lot of that. Um, and, and I did have wonderful opportunities. It, it's really hard, you know, to go from being an IP guy to a commercial lawyer, you know, or um, going and, and doing, you know, a big transaction that's really outside of your space. And when you think about in-house and especially how lean we are at Phillips 66, one of the great things that's happened is you can wear a lot of different hats. Um, You can get out of your comfort zone pretty quickly. And 
I think that's benefited me, you know, in a lot of ways, just the diversity of work, you know, new challenges, um, working with new people. It just keeps it fresh, you know, really on a daily basis. Yeah, that's great. Um, I was curious when you mentioned that the client kind of put a bug in your ear about going in-house. Did you get this particular job um, through that client or was it? No, no. Actually, what happened was, you know, with large organizations, the job process can actually be pretty long and and frustrating, Um, meaning, you know, there's a posting, but it could still take them several months um, to actually get going and review resumes and, and call for interviews. This was a situation where it took almost a year for the job to be posted. I mean, I think he he felt confident that I was interested at that point. Like we had some specific conversations and then he finally pinged me and said the job is posted. And I was basically about to step into that process and and really step way out of my comfort zone because I grew up in Texas. I've always lived in, in Texas and this job was was outside of Texas. And I thought, well, again, another another challenge might might be good. Um, but the almost identical job was posted for another company in Houston. And, you know, once I landed that, I, I said, well, I, I want to stay here. I was in a relationship at the time. Um, I just felt really established in Houston um, at that point because I had been here for, you know, five or six years at that point. Absolutely. No, that makes sense. I, I tell you, it's too, too many changes at once, perhaps. <laughs> and, um, and I will say that there was a cost of living factor, you know, um, the move out of state, you know, tax consideration, cost of living, all, all these things that I think is actually um, a big advantage for living in Houston. Um, you, you know, there's just it's just good salaries and, and lower cost of living in, in a lot of um, respects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned kind of, you know, this transition from law firm to in-house and, you know, in talking to folks who made this leap, um, sometimes they feel really prepared. Um, and other times, you know, if they're doing things that are kind of out of their cut effort zone or, you know, dealing with, you know, sort of the transition of having um, this one client, but a bunch of different business interests, it can, it can be a little bit of a, you know, culture shock or did you feel prepared um, for that leap? Was it, you know, were, were you were you ready to go or were there any hiccups um, as you made that first step into being an in-house attorney? They, there were hiccups, but it has nothing to do with being substantively prepared or experienced to kind of handle the core matters that I was hired to to provide counsel on. It actually is a lot more practical than that. So, again, the process of, of going to to really any any company or, or new law firm can take some time, um, background checks, whatever. There's just there's just a, a, a delay, right? So even when you've accepted the job, you're still waiting and okay, now the start date's another two weeks from now. Um, but once, you know, once I got the job and I was pretty confident everything was gonna go forward, you know, you kind of get geared up, like I'm, I'm excited and um, it's gonna be a new opportunity. And on my fourth day, I still remember it because it was a pretty large campus where, where I'd started working. Um, it, was, it was one of the predecessors of, of this company that I work for now. Um, it was the fourth day I was walking through the campus, which was difficult enough to navigate, just getting to my office. And this big announcement comes through on my BlackBerry, um, not to date myself and how long ago this was. <laughs> and it said that they were splitting this Fortune 10 company in half. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I walk into actually another former King and Spalding lawyer's office and I said, is this a big deal? And she just burst out laughing at me. And so it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, maybe I'm a lot more naive, you know, um, than what I think I know about the corporate world right now. And and I think that's very true, again, looking back. Um, but what happened was I really, you know, there was a lot of anxiousness, of course, around what was going to happen with, with job roles and no one was guaranteed anything. But, you know, in theory, since it was a splitting up of companies versus a merger, they were actually going to be more jobs. You know, we need two general counsels. We need two CEOs. Um, but I, I use it as an opportunity to take to dive, take a deep dive into the actual 
process of splitting the company. And it was just way outside of my comfort zone. So I dug into that pretty um, wholeheartedly, you know, pretty passionately. And I tried to quickly establish relationships. And ironically, it was with some of the more senior paralegals on the corporate side who I felt like just really trained me up, you know, and, and I'm sure that's the case. And people have experiences like that in law firms too, um, as baby lawyers. Um, but that's kind of, I really just took the opportunity, like, I'm going to use this as a learning opportunity. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to learn about how corporations and assets and things are all structured. And so when I describe it to, to other people, when I'm talking about it, it almost felt like an, a mini MBA. It was almost like less law and more business. Um, so what was initially a very shocking and, um, you know, concerning moment in time turned out to be this phenomenal opportunity that I think has really been um, something that's propelled me, you know, further than I would have gone otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah, that is. A, I didn't realize this happened. The split uh, of the company happened only four days or, you know, it was announced only four days into your. That's right. Yeah. In <laughs> fact, there was supposed to be a woman starting like the next Monday and and she had already pulled out. And oh. so, I mean, again, like I was in close contact with the partner I work for and I was like, I just I don't really know what's going to happen. And of course, they were like really reassuring and said, you're welcome to come back at any time. And so that that definitely helped. And I've I've kept up with a lot of those relationships. But again, not having any guarantee. And, and of course, one of the strategies that I was thinking was going in house would give me stability. Well, the first week, you know, I feel instability. So yeah, exactly. sort of frustration, you know, if that was one of my primary goals. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and I think that is a thing that's like a trope, right? Which is, you know, um, that somehow, you know, being in-house at a corporation or being in a corporate legal department is, you know, guarantees stability and guarantees certain things. And I think, um, you know, in this day and age, nothing is really guaranteed. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of the world events we've experienced in the last few years have probably shown us that. And so, um, you know, I think it's smart, you know, probably to to not take, take these things um, for granted. But you clearly came out of that, you know, initial experience um, and, th and thrived. I mean, you won awards for your, your knowledge in the IP space. You know, I, you're clearly a leader at your company. Um, and I wanted to, you know, sort of better understand what factors do you think contributed to your success, um, you know, once you made that in-house leap? Well, and it's it, it's interesting, like when we had our previous conversation and talking about the theme of your podcast, you know, I think when you read off my bio or anyone and goes and looks at a bio of a really successful professional, like well, what you're reading is all the positives of <laughs> and accomplishments of that person. There isn't a separate section that says, here are all the hiccups and errors I made. Yes. And so... <laughs> You, oh, right. you know, it's it's almost like the situation where we have a false impression of everyone. Yes. And then you're Maybe. siloed, you're siloed, you know, in your own head and, and thinking, why is everybody else so successful and they don't have to deal with what I had to deal with? And the thing is, everybody has these challenges. We just don't post it publicly. Exactly. Only the shiny stuff. Only the only, only the, the shiny stuff. Only the shiny rainbows so, and unicorns. Yeah. So the message that I always like to tell mentees that I work with is the road is never going to be completely smooth. There are bumps in it. And you know, no matter, you know, who you look up to, they've had not the exact same path, but they've they've had their own bumps as well. Exactly. No, I totally, I totally, uh, I totally agree in that regard. You know, it, 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 we can keep the names out of this to protect the innocent um, or the guilty. But you know, are there certain sort of hiccups um, over your career that sort of stand out for you that you kind of came, came, you know, got through it, um, you know, and learned some lessons from it in the process? Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely give you specific examples of you know, challenging clients and trying to form relationships and things like that. These sort of EQ things that you aren't taught in any sort of law school or grad school. You have to 
learn, you know, on your own on the fly and and adjust of course to that person's personality. Um, so I had, you know, several of those experiences, which I think a lot of people do. Um, but when I was reflecting on, you know, these these big bumps or these big milestones um, throughout, let's say the last 25 years, even going back to college, um, it's almost I, I view it as situations where I was the loneliest in the sense that I didn't have this built in network that I could rely on. Um, e either, you know, friends that were close had moved away or my family had moved away. And I just felt isolated in the sense that I had to do it all all myself, you know, and I didn't have anyone to to bounce things off of. Um, so a couple of times it happened. Um, second semester of college um, through a series of just things that were going on. I, I had I was busy with school, but I really wasn't socializing that much. I had pledged a fraternity the first semester and that, of course, is very um, time consuming and you just you're just busy. And so you really don't have time to think about yourself. But then when that second semester hit and I, I didn't have the same time commitment, you know, college is very different. And I think second semester was much harder for me to adjust to because you really have to manage your own time. You know, you don't spend a lot of time in class. And so you're um, that was a very uh, challenging thing. And, and I and I struggled academically that semester, quite frankly. Um, I came out of that semester in the summer, like questioning what I was really going to do, what my future looked like. And of course, my mom and dad were huge supporters of me. Um, and I just mapped out a plan like I've got to really buckle down and this is going to be my schedule, like on a weekday basis. And I'm going to yeah. study with this, you know, these these um, these patterns, you know, and, and I think that's then when I finally started being successful. And then same thing, um, not in law school, because again, I think you have, you're so busy, you have this built in group of people that you're getting to know. It was really post law school. And I actually started at a much smaller boutique firm, which was great training, right? Getting to, to dig into things really quickly and take ownership of, of larger cases. Um, but it was a time when several friends had moved away. I was back in my hometown. I really thought that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to live in Austin for the rest of my life. Um, my sister had moved away a, a while ago. She was in Colorado, but but about a year after I graduated law school, my parents retired in Montana. So they were like more than 2000 miles away. So there was no popping in. And again, just like thinking about being alone and isolated and not talking about like what struggles I was having. And, and those could be big or small. But, you know, my message is to to young associates or or young people like don't keep it in. You know, you don't have to shoulder this on your own. And we all have different burdens and different seasons. Um, but the worst thing you can do is just keep it to yourself. Um, there are so many people that can help if you just ask. No, I think I think that's great advice, Craig. Um, you know, it's some of the conversations I've had in this podcast have been, you know, around mental health. Um and we all know as members of the legal community, you know, the incidence of um, depression and suicide and things like that um, amongst our peer group and our colleagues is, is rather, rather high. Um, and there, you know, I think there is this, um, I mean, it's a sort of uh, societal uh, thing, but it's also um, pretty, you know, prevalent and acute, I think, in the legal profession, which is this like, Fierce independence, go it alone. You know, we're, we're here for the client to keep your feelings to yourself. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Be a zealous advocate. Well, you know, zealous advocate means no be, be strong. Be strong. strong. Don't, don't show weakness or vulnerability. Yeah. Exactly. Um, don't cry. Certainly not in the office. And don't admit your failures or weaknesses to anybody who, has, you know, is related or in charge of your career. And, um, you know, that can be dangerous uh, for sure. And it can lead to loneliness and depression and you know, suicidality and all sorts of things. Um, I, I was curious, you know, particularly when your parents moved to Montana, your sister's gone, you know, you're trying, you know, trying to be this new professional, which can also be like a sort of stressful time when you're trying to find your professional footing and, you know, your identity and, and navigate, like you said, some of these things that like, 
they don't teach you, right? Um, you know, a, a client comes to you with a squirrely problem that's not textbook, and how do you be creative and and, and do that? And that, that can be a little bit different than than uh, taking a, a law school exam. Um, what what helped you during that time? You know, what kind of helped you get out of that that funk or that those feelings of um, isolation um, when when you were experiencing that then? I think just coming to the realization that as much as I loved Austin, that I needed to be in a different geographic setting. And I want I knew I wanted to stay in Texas. I knew I probably wanted to still stay in a larger city. So that left me with Dallas and Houston. I had visited both cities, you know, throughout college and law school. I was probably more familiar with Dallas because of the geographic proximity to to Waco where I went to law school. I had one of my best friends going to law school at SMU, so he would come down and I would pop up there just an hour and a half difference. But um when I was comparing Dallas and Houston, I did have m- more closer friends in Houston and Houston felt a little bit more culturally diverse. I mean, it's certainly not Austin, although Austin's changed significantly in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, but I could see pockets and shades of Austin within Houston. And and so just that attracted um, it to me. And it really goes back to some of the first advice I ever got before I even applied to law school when I was talking with my uncle, who's been practicing for now probably 30 plus years and is at a partner at a a major law firm. Um, He said, you know, I actually wouldn't think about it in terms of the substance because you can't ever predict, well, this is the practice area that's going to be thriving in five years when I graduate, um, whether it's IP or oil and gas um, or some other specialty area. He said, I would think about it geographically, like, where do you think you want to practice? You know, Probably going to be in Texas because, you know, I'm getting trained in Texas under Texas law. Um, But he said, be specific even in cities because you start breaking it down by city like there's going to be specific firms there. There's specific industries there and it's just going to start leading you down this path. So, well, I think my initial goal was I'm going to get back to Austin. Like I'm thinking about the geography of it. I don't think in the end, based on the industry my background, my training, that it had the right firms that were representing the types of clients that I really wanted to to represent and work with. And Houston presented exactly that. Um, So it just became hugely attractive at that point. No, I th- that that's great advice. Um, we regularly, as recruiters, speak to um, students at, at various law schools uh, across the United States, and that is a piece of advice that may or may not get taken in, um, but we hope that it does because we, you know, we always kind of share you you need to be a little more granular when you're thinking about um, where you ultimately want to be, and it may change and, and morph and take different shapes over time. But, um, you know, the nature of the legal work is going to vary from state to state and from city to city within those states. And so uh, that, I think that I think your uncle was was giving you some great advice. Um, yeah. And, and, substan- and substantively, you know, you don't always know what you're going to like until you really get into the trenches, you know, that's Again, right. like on the on the face of it, things look shiny and new and great. But you don't I mean, you've got to really like the day to day. You've got to like the flow. You've got to like the industry or the businesses that you're supporting or, you know, if it's criminal law, that's that's fine, too. Of course, you have to you have to do it because you spend at least I spend most of my waking hours at the office. And I think it's really important that you enjoy being around the people you work with and and doing the work you do. And that doesn't mean you have to like every single task. I think that's another, probably more of a realization than a piece of advice I got. You know, there are things that I don't like in my job. I like most things, but there's not some ideal job out there that if I change jobs, change companies that, okay, now everything is perfect. Like I got rid of all the administrative stuff I don't like. <laughs> and yeah. so the the way I've always looked at that, and I think early on in your career, you have a lot more of the stuff you don't like, right? Because you're just you're just learning. You're learning the basics and you're in discovery and document review and all these things that are 
not sexy, but if you roll up your sleeves, show that work ethic, that's going to be a launch pad to doing all these things that then you can ultimately just enjoy i mean thrive on right that's that's really where you want to get to any point in your career like you just don't even think of it as work it just becomes you you just really enjoy it and it and it doesn't have to be your sole passion right i highly encourage everybody to have other passions outside of work and i think that goes back to the point of being siloed and connecting with other people so not trying to say like make your job your life like there's balance to that but that's i think what at least my goal has been like find this niche in this space um and and still my goal like i am having new passions like as i work with new clients um i did not historically at the firm work much in the area of technology or it and data protection and cybersecurity certainly have emerged as as major issues um from a regulatory and um, litigation standpoint over the last five to ten years so I, I'm having new passion uh, around that um, in those emerging areas. No, this this is this is great. So you know, it, it seems to me, kind of taking a step back and looking at your career, Craig, like you, you know, even as an associate, um, junior, mid level, et cetera, you, you know, kind of found time to network. Um, you know, do you have any advice? to um, anybody in our listening audience who might be kind of on the junior end of that, you know, it, learning the law is, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, a huge, uh, take, takes a huge amount of time, you know, just being, you know, good at what, what it is that lawyers do can give, they don't necessarily teach you all the ins and outs in law school, right? They teach you a lot of theory. And then there's a lot of learning on the fly on the job. So that's, you know, a, a, something that takes up a huge amount of time. But do you have advice or any tips or tricks or anything, uh, tools of the trade related to kind of that expanding your network um, and, and meeting new people who might be mentors or might lead to job opportunities like yours did? Um, or again, you know, people to get advice from when you are in that place where you don't know what you're doing and you're feeling overwhelmed and kind of bewildered. Certainly. Yeah, I think I think you have to put in the time and effort. And that's really not easy when you're thinking about billable hours and a finite amount of time, you know, in the day. Um, and, it, and it didn't go um, in terms of networking super smoothly, you know, early on in my career. Um, but my advice is to to keep at it. Um, to be curious, to ask questions. I mean, e even as, so, so one piece of advice I always give people who are meeting new lawyers or interviewing, and, and I gave this advice going back to the firm, like you you should be asking any new person, any new lawyer you're meeting, tell, tell me what you do. Like, who, who are you representing? What's your practice like? Because one of the most shocking things to me being at King and Spalding, um, and, and I'm sure is the case at any other law, large law firm is, how different lawyers are even in specific practice groups i mean the, the the expertise and the again the industries they support it's like it's so nuanced and at that point if you're in front of a seasoned lawyer you know they love they're going to love talking about their practice because that's what they have chosen to to do and i felt like i just was absorbing you know all this new information and just had no idea how many different types of lawyers, um, even on a single floor of a law firm, you know, it's like, wow, there's just so much here. So you don't know what you don't know. Um, ask questions, keep learning um, in terms of networking. Um, yeah. Like I said, I didn't, it didn't go well at first, like as a young associate, I, I don't think it was a lack of confidence. Like I felt like I was pretty assertive um, and, and introduced myself. But it is about finding the right fit and network. And so to try and not use names, I had been historically um, pretty involved in a in a larger trade organization, let's call it. But the way in which we were connecting on a regular basis was basically, you know, dozens of people on a conference call with very little face to face um, interaction. OK. And so I I started kind of stepping away from that because I just didn't think. I was getting the value in return for the time I was investing. So then 
I think it was around 2016, I got a call from actually an outside lawyer that I am very close to and consider a mentor. And he invited me to join the state bar IP section. And my initial reaction was no way. That sounds like way too much of a time commitment. I am not going to get any, you know, professional, personal career benefit out of it. That's, you know, kind of kind of the mindset of what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. But he still convinced me to do it. And it's one of the best career decisions I made. You know, it's my, it's the donation of my time. But the relationships I've formed, um, I was reflecting on this morning, like I just feel so fortunate to know and work with the people you know that i do um especially externally the outside counsel or other friends who are in this practice area um and i just i, I just i feel so grateful that uh, i did take that leap i did take the risk because that's when i think the external networking has really popped for me and and i'm not saying i'm better at it than anybody else like it still takes me effort it still doesn't go always as planned but um without finding that you know that network um and and it's been great because i think there is a lot more face-to-face -face interaction it's geographically you know it's more in in texas so we do have a more frequent um in-person meetings um, but again lawyers i would never have met otherwise because they live in other cities we've come together and i and i look back and i'm like wow we really have accomplished some pretty big things we've done some big projects on the national level in the last few years and promoted our area of IP law in a way that, again, I never would have been able to predict um, when I was first invited to to join this this group. No, I think I think that's great advice. And I um in, in mentoring more junior folks, I think it's great your point about um, kind of thinking what's in it for me. And, and I think, you know, if you're trying to get close to a more senior attorney or, or anyone who's, you know, gone before you in life. Um, I think recognizing that they're busy people and they're giving of themselves when they share their time or, you know, and, and, and trying to figure out ways in which you can do something for them and be of service to them is really a great way to ingratiate yourself um, to others and, and, and be around folks that um, might have some value to share. So I liked your, your point, which is like, it doesn't always have to be What's in it for me, right? What am I going to get out of it? Especially it, the immediacy of that. You may not know what you're going to get out of it until you kind of um, put yourself out there a little bit. And I think there's some hesitancy um, because I certainly had it initially on that, you know, asking for help or trying to form a connection. And I think what will surprise a lot of people if they just take the time to do it is um, reaching out. You know, it's not going to be successful 100 percent of the time, but I get a lot of call them random LinkedIn requests from students who are um, in undergrad or in law school and they just want to hear about my practice. I think that's exactly what students should be doing. And not every lawyer is going to respond, but I think you'll be surprised how many are willing to to engage and how beneficial it can be to both parties to have a 15 minute dialogue you know every time i'm getting mentored i'm learning something but i learn something by mentoring others as well you learn you learn about yourself you learn about other people's paths so there's a lot of value in that and i know i wouldn't have had any of the success without finding these these people that i lead on you know and that i seek advice and counsel from um and I, it may be a little cliche but like i feel like this deep burning duty to pay it forward because i have again like i'm i wouldn't have benefited without the help of others i mean yeah. I, it, it's just it's just that's it we can we can never go it alone um that pulling that's yourself right. bootstraps thing is is a little bit of a of a force i agree i don't know any successful person that did it completely alone it, it doesn't doesn't happen and i think that's a great point um i love your point craig about sticking with it, you know, this sort of proverbial, like getting doors slammed in your face or getting no's or not getting responses to your emails or phone calls. And that's going to happen a lot in life. And, and I think the more 
um, I can say, um, immune you can become to that um, and, and keep going, uh, the more likely you are as a professional to be successful. And it takes some resilience to do that, right? Um, there are a lot of people that if they don't get the thing that they want the first time, they don't keep going after it. And I'm curious, you know, just for yourself, where does that resilience come from? You know, wh where do you think, you know, is, is, is it something that was kind of imbued in you in your formative years or did it come later? I, I, I'm curious about that. I, I think it, it comes from, quite frankly, a, a lack of innate talent. You know, I, I would never claim to be the smartest person in their room, but I'll tell you, I'm probably one of the hardest workers in the room. I'm probably more persistent than someone else in the room. Um, I'm probably more passionate. And so in a lot of ways, we're born with the brains and the bodies that we have. And some are innately better than others, right? Just like an athlete. And you have to lean on these other skills, you know, and qualities that you actually do have a choice in, right? Um, and, and I've seen it throughout you know, lots of different um, friends. And I think, you know, professionally um, in the sports world, you can see it. There are lots of people who have all the talent in the world. They have the measurements, they have the speed, they have the strength, but it's really the ones who are mentally prepared. They are, again, resilient and, and they have this mindset. So once you get to, you know, the NBA, let's say, Everyone is is physically talented, but the champions and the winners and the ones who are consistently making the all star team, I think that what sets them apart is their training, their mental outlook, you know, these other attributes that you have, you know, much more control over. Um, and so that's why I love the theme of this podcast. Um, I agreed to do it before I even knew, um, but you could easily say that is a huge theme just across my entire life, you know, that um, I've had to overcome, I think, more than others in that regard. No, I think, I think it's, it's funny or ironic to hear you say that, right? Because you've had incredible success and you're like, I don't have any innate talent, but you know, I, I understand where you're, where you're coming from and identify with it. You know, we don't, aren't necessarily born, um, you know, being like, primed for being the best lawyer it takes work um to get you know to where you are because there's so many different skills that come, come well, well i say i and i say that too because you know there's like really significant um emphasis put on did you graduate in the top 10 percent of your class you know and if and if you didn't what does that mean i mean 90 percent of the rest of the students graduating are going to be practicing law too and that doesn't define whether you're going to be a good lawyer or a bad lawyer, because we all know that taking tests, you know, for one single class once a semester is quite different than practicing law, interacting with clients, interacting with the jury, interacting with the judge. And so, you know, my message to you is there, you know, or, or, or one point I'll make is just because somebody graduates number one and is deemed, you know, the most academically successful in that in that class, there's no guarantee that person is going to be a, a great lawyer. You know, they might have, again, all these credentials on their website. They're super lawyer. They're recognized. Again, I don't think that makes you a great lawyer. I think results make you a good lawyer. I think accomplishing client goals make you a good lawyer, I think having healthy relationships with your coworkers and your clients makes you a good lawyer. There are all these other factors that aren't quantifiable like grades are. Exactly. Agreed. Amen. Well, um, as we're getting close to our time here, I wanted to ask you a closing question, Craig. You know, there's been a lot of tumult uh, in the world due to COVID and other world events uh in the last few years along with just general tumult in the legal industry mergers you know acquisitions and furloughs and all kinds of things um of late um and i was wondering what advice you would give newly minted attorneys who may not have experienced this kind of 
macro or micro uh, tumult in their lives uh, before, whether that's professional or personal tumult? Yeah, pr probably again, very cliche, but I still think it's important to remind ourselves um, when we're facing, you know, the uncertainty and the challenges. Um, there's one thing for certain, the season is gonna change. Um, what's happening now is not gonna be happening tomorrow or a year from now. And the thing that you can do, I think, as a young lawyer is find a mentor or mentors as quickly as possible. And again, I think that takes effort, finding that right connection. But you've got to find somebody that you can speak openly, candidly, you know, and 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 that will, in the same vein, speak candidly to you, you know, and give you um, the advice. But you want to be in front of someone who has gone a little bit farther down the path, right? They have a path. What was it like for you? What did you do to overcome those things? So talking about it again, not holding it in. And likewise, you know, find someone you can mentor, because I think that helps you as well. Um, you're forming another relationship and it sort of creates this cycle. So my advice, usually my closing statement when I'm speaking to a group on, on topics like this is find a mentor, be a mentor, um, because I think both are very important and both have great benefits to you, you know, no matter what point you are in your career and start doing it early, right? So when you do it early and you're baby lawyer, you might be talking to undergrad students, but at some point you'll grow up and you'll be talking to the young associates and then you're the senior lawyer. But even those senior lawyers have mentors. They have to go to people to get advice. You know, maybe it's at a different cadence, but they have challenges too. I think that's great. Excellent advice. Well, Craig, I really appreciate you giving me and our listeners so much of your time today and sharing your experiences. Um, I know they will find them value valuable because I have found them valuable and I sincerely uh, appreciate your time. No, it's my pleasure. It's it's really interesting, you know, again, time wise, because I, I feel like I'm mid career, you know, almost 20 years in and I'm at a point where, you know, I'm doing a lot of reflecting of what does the next 10 years look like for me and what new challenges can I take on? And I'm having to think pretty you know, hard about those. And I'm putting pen to paper to say, you know, what does that look like if I had to create that? Um, and I know it's going to be different than what I think it will play out like today. Um, but I'm trying to set myself up, you know, hey, here's how I'm strategically thinking about the next steps I want to take. And maybe a mentor or a leader manager that I talk to say, well, I see this um, happening for you uh, differently. Um, that's OK. That's great. I think that's awesome perspective to get that. Um, but you starting to formulate your own plan, getting that feedback, seeing where you need to grow, whether it's finding a new skill, having a new experience, finding a leadership opportunity, which could happen professionally, you know, in-house or it could happen externally at a nonprofit organization like i've done um, look for those opportunities um, don't be afraid to to jump off the cliff and and take a little risk um, because it doesn't mean you have to commit to it forever um, but hopefully one of those leaps you'll find exactly where you um, can land uh, comfortably this is great advice thank you thank you for listening to bouncing back resilience for lawyers Join us next time for another story about thriving after overcoming challenges. You can find Bouncing Back and other programming for lawyers on MLA's Legal Talk Network.